that if you'll just bow, bow your heads with me and I'll pray. Dear Lord, thank you for being here with us today. Um, thank you that I'm able to stand up here and talk about you and talk about the experiences that I've had while I've been away. Pray that you'll just yeah, fill this room and fill me with your Holy Spirit and really speak through me. Um, be with everyone here and just help them to get something out of what I have to say to them today because I know that you've given me this message to speak to them and I thank you for that. So, yeah, be with me as I speak today. Amen. Most of you probably don't know all that much about what I've been doing in the last few months. Uh, so I've been at Arise in Australia, which is a 15-week discipleship program at Kingscliff Church. Uh, we spent four to six hours a day in class doing intensive Bible study and covering a whole lot of different topics. And I learned a lot of things from the Bible that I'd never actually heard of before. And I learned how to study the Bible with someone and how to study it for myself. And I learned how to share my faith with others. We did about 10 hours of outreach most weeks, which was knocking on people's doors and looking for people to study the Bible with us. I got to study with two different people, and that really helped me to see just how the gospel can have an impact on people's lives. One lady that we visited in, in her home many times called Lola had been wanting to study the Bible with Adventists for a while, and she had a friend that was going to bring someone around to study with her, but she kept putting it off because she was too nervous. And then my outreach partner and I turned up on her doorstep one day and we got to know her over a couple of visits and started studying the Bible with her. She would ask us questions and we'd give her Bible verses to look at and we discussed a lot of different topics with her. She has pretty bad anxiety and is mostly deaf, so she struggles to meet new people and the idea of going to a new church just really scared her, so she hadn't done it yet. But me and my outreach partner, we got to know her a bit and we prayed with her and we encouraged her, and she came along to church with us. She got to know a few different people there, and she's still going along now. And I can see that God definitely put her there at the right time, put us there, sorry, at the right time for her. There were a couple of other times when God put us in funny places at funny times, and then crazy things happened. Twice we drove over to the other side of the area that we were door knocking in. Once it was just to go to the bathrooms and... Once it was because we'd finished everywhere else and we just wanted a small street to do before we went home. And we stumbled upon people that we'd met previously and we had good conversations with them. One was a lady called Mel, whose dad had recently passed away when we first visited her. She was too upset to study with us, but we told her that we'd pray for her when we went home. And we did all that week. And when we came across her about a week later, in a different street that we just happened to go to because it was by the bathrooms, not even near the area that we first met her, not even in the same house. She called out a window to us and asked if we prayed for her, and we told her that we had. And she, she, she said that she knew she had. She knew we had because she'd felt it. That was a big reminder to me that prayer is powerful and people see it having an effect on their lives. Mel didn't study the Bible with us, but she felt the power of God because of us. That was a rough week for me because I couldn't see God working in what we were doing. But God put us in that street at the right time so that we would see Mel again. And it made me realize that God was definitely working alongside us and working in the people's lives that we were coming in contact with. There were many times that something I'd read in the morning or something we'd learned in class was an exact answer to something that someone would ask me later in the day while we were out knocking on doors. And it wasn't even an answer that I would have been able to give them the day before. I've seen how incredible God's timing is. He knows the people that we're going to come across every day. And he knows the situations that we'll be in. And he prepares us for them without us even realizing. During my time at Arise, I saw many answers to prayer. Some were small and some were huge. Sometimes it was opportunities that God gave me. Sometimes it was something someone said. And sometimes God would put a Bible passage in my mind when I was struggling with something. And when I read it, it felt like he was speaking directly to me through the words. I've seen how powerful prayer is and have been encouraged to pray a lot more. And the more I pray, the more miraculous things I see happening. During door knocking at Arise, I had a lot of conversations with people about their ideas about God and their beliefs. And one very common theme that I noticed was how people had a skewed picture of God, which made them want nothing to do with him. 
They didn't like the false idea they've been told of hell, which painted a picture of a mean God that tortures people forever. Or they didn't like a God that seemingly wiped out whole nations for no reason. They didn't like a God that was all about rules and no fun, controlling and judgmental. They had believed lies that they'd been told about God's character, and I desperately wanted to sit them down and tell them about the God that I've come to know, a God of love, a God that desires everyone's happiness, a God that desires everyone to be saved. If only they could see what kind of God I have seen. If only they could see God's true character. The biggest life-changing for me, life-changing thing for me at Arise wasn't the answers to prayer or the miracles that I saw. It wasn't the sermons I heard or the classes that we had. It wasn't the teachers and it wasn't the good friends that I made. It was devotions. Spending time each morning reading my Bible and talking with God. At first it was kind of hard and I didn't really know what to read each morning, but someone encouraged me to start going through the Gospel of John, and so I did that. If you'd turn there with me now, that's where we're going to start reading from today. John chapter 1. I went through John bit by bit during my morning devotions, and it's become my favourite book of the Bible because it gave me a new picture of God, um, yeah, of the God that wants to be a part of my life and wants me to know him personally. It helped me to see the true loving character of God. Let's start by reading the first three words in John chapter 1, in the beginning. This takes us directly back to the account of creation at the start of the Old Testament, Genesis 1.1, which says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In Genesis, we're told who created the world, God. And in John, we're told more specifically, the word. If you look down to verse 14, it tells us it tells us who the word is. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word is Jesus Christ. God came to earth to live as a human, to die for humans. Going back to verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. This tells us three things. One, when Jesus existed. He existed in the beginning, before creation, before time. He always is, and he always was. The second thing it tells us is his relationship with the Father, and the word was with God. He was existing in unity with God, is one with God in relationship with the Father. The third thing it tells us is his identity. And the word was God. Jesus is God. He is not just God's son, but he is God himself. In John 10.30, Jesus said, I and my father are one. And the Jews took up stones to stone him, saying, For a good work I do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. But this was not blasphemy, because Jesus is God. The word, Jesus, is God and is with God and existed in the beginning before time as one with God. Verse 3 tells us a fourth thing about Jesus, his relationship with the world. So if you look at verse 3 with me. All things were made through him, and nothing, and without him nothing was made that was made. The word, Jesus, is our creator. He is our Lord, our saviour, and our maker. He created everything we see, and every single one of us. Genesis tells us, in the beginning, God created everything. And John tells us more specifically, in the beginning was the word, and all things were made through him. My favourite translation of these verses is found in the Passion Translation Bible, which reads, in the very beginning, the living expression was already there. And the living expression was with God, yet fully God. They were together, face to face, in the very beginning. And through his creative inspiration, this living expression made all things, for nothing has existence apart from him. Here, Jesus is called the living expression. The living, walking, breathing expression. The expression of what? From the beginning, Satan made accusations against God that tainted our picture of him. But Jesus' mission on earth was to show us his true character. The first time we see God walking on earth, is in the very beginning with Adam, with Adam and Eve, 
in a perfect world with perfect humans. Then we see the fall and God's character seemingly compromised. We see him again in the New Testament, walking on earth. This time, he walks with sinners. He dwells among sinners. And his attitude towards sinful humans is the same as it was at the beginning towards perfect humans, an attitude of love. Jesus came to earth and showed us what God is really like. He revealed to us the true character of God. He was the living expression of God's character and his love towards us. John 1.18 tells us, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. In the Passion Translation, this reads, No one has ever gazed upon the fullness of God's splendour except the uniquely beloved Son, who is cherished by the Father and held close to his heart. Now he has unfolded to us the full explanation of who God truly is. This is what Jesus came to do, reveal the character of God to us. John 8, 12 says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Here again, we see Jesus' mission on earth. Light here could represent the true knowledge of God and understanding, and darkness, a misunderstanding about God's character. Jesus says he is the light here to take people out of the darkness so they can walk in the light, so they can see his true character. The picture of God that I used to see in the Old Testament was not pretty. I couldn't see, of God, I couldn't see a God of love, and it was easy to see God depicted as harsh, mean, controlling, and unmerciful. And I saw him as separate from humanity. And then I would read the New Testament and see Jesus, the Son of God, who was the living expression of God's love. He cared for humanity. He came and threw away all the views that the religious leaders had of God. He hung out with sinners and ate with them. He touched the sick and the unclean, and he loved the unlovable. We're going to look at a story in Luke now. So if you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 19. This is the story of Zacchaeus. Luke chapter 19, and beginning in verse 1. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. Here we see a sinner. Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector, and he had a bad reputation. He robbed people of their money, and he was rich because of it. And the people did not like him. Now from verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus. The first surprising thing that Jesus does here is stop along the road amongst the crowd. He looks up into the tree and acknowledges Zacchaeus by name. The people would have been wondering here what Jesus was about to do. Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Jesus does a very shocking thing here. He invites himself to stay with Zacchaeus at his house. Verse 6. So he made haste and came down, and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying... He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. The Pharisees were not happy that Jesus, who people looked up to, was associating with Zacchaeus, who they thought of as lowest of the low. They were the highest in the Jewish society, and they were looked up to by the people. They avoided people like Zacchaeus because they wanted to maintain their clean image. And here Jesus is going to stay with Zacchaeus at his house and be his guest. Verse 8. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone, by false accusation I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save 
that which was lost. Jesus didn't avoid people like this, like the religious leaders expected him to. He dwelt with them. He ate with Zacchaeus in his house. He loved him despite the things he did, and he saw potential in him. Jesus sees beyond what we do and sees who we are, his. Jesus' disciples and those that followed him believed that he had come, he had come to set up his kingdom on earth. They expected that he would fight against those persecuting him, but he didn't because his kingdom was not of this world. He was bringing a new type of kingdom, of peace, not violence, of truth, not lies. All thought that his would be an earthly kingdom and that he would conquer and save the Jews. But he was doing much more than that. He was conquering sin to save us. He was showing us the love that he had for us and the love that he wants to show us to show to other people. He had a genuine love for people. He went around healing the sick, lifting people's spirits and showing love to everyone. And not just, not just those that did the right thing, but everyone. I have seen how the God of the Old and the New Testament are the same. Jesus is the Word. He is the living expression of God's Word in the flesh. He came to change the bad views that people had of him, to flip them around and reveal his true character. He is love. He came to love and serve humanity, something that ultimately we fail at doing. But through his love, life and sacrifice, we can have a part in that. We can follow his example and live as he lived. We can be loving people too. We can be kind, helpful, caring and selfless. But that love comes from God because God is love. He puts that love in our hearts. The same love that was ingrained in every fibre of Jesus' being, the love of God. Something that I have to ask myself sometimes and something that we should all ask ourselves is, are we reflecting God's character of love? Another story we're going to look at is in Acts 9, which is the story of Saul's conversion. So let's turn there now. Acts chapter 9. Back in chapter 8, verse 3 tells us, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. We see Saul persecuting the Christians because he didn't like what they were saying about Jesus. He believed that the crucified Messiah, Jesus as the crucified Messiah was a lie, that Jesus was an imposter. He thought he knew God. He knew the Torah, and he thought he knew the God of the Old Testament. He thought that he was earning favour with God by the works that he was doing. Let's read now from chapter 9, verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Saul then gets up, unable to see. The people with him lead him into Damascus, and he stays blind for three days. The Lord then appears to a man named Ananias in a vision and tells him to go and visit Saul. He goes, and he lays hands on Saul, who gets his sight back and is baptised. Let's jump down to verse 20 now. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose, so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus 
proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Let's jump down now to verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Christ appeared to Paul, he asked him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? All along, he had been persecuting God's people when he thought that he was working for God. He had a skewed picture of God and who God was and what he stood for. Saul had missed the whole point. When he met Jesus, the living expression, God on earth, he suddenly realized who God was. And he immediately dedicated his whole life to him, ministering to others and preaching boldly about Jesus. Saul saw God's character in Jesus, the living expression, and it changed his view of God. When he saw the true character of God and the love that he had for him, he was compelled to turn and follow him, and he gave his life to living for him. When we see the love that Jesus has for us and those around us, we should also be compelled to live for him. Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, loves us so much that he came to earth and gave his life for us, to save us, to deal with the problem of sin. Romans 5 verse 8 shows us just how much God really loves us. It says this, But God demonstrates his own love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus came to earth and died for the people that nailed him to the cross. He came to earth and died for you and me. Despite all of our sin, even with all of our sin, Jesus still loves us and he gave his life for us. So we, when we come to see this love that he has for us, when we come to know him personally, and when we see his true character, why should we not then give our lives back to him as Saul did? I have been to many church, youth and big camps, summer camp, youth events, and now Arise. I guess every time I went to these things, I knew it was an opportunity for a spiritual high, a feeling of closeness with God that I didn't normally have during everyday life. But what I've come to realize is that while these things are good while I'm at them, that feeling of closeness never, never lasts when I go home. Like I said earlier, the biggest thing that arrived for me was spending time each morning with God. We can't have a personal relationship with him by just going to spiritual events going to church, singing songs, or listening to people talk about him. We have to go to God ourselves and build that relationship with him through prayer and time in his word. While I have had a life-changing experience at Arise, and that's good for me, the good news is that it doesn't take something like Arise to do that. You can have a relationship with him now, and that can start today. John 1.39 says, He said to them, Come and see. Jesus invites us to come and see. He wants our experience with him to be personal and interactive, taking a step of faith, trusting in him and stepping out to see who he really is. One of our class teachers said many times, the knowing is in the going. Jesus invites us to come and see who he is and get to know him. Take action, open the word, and get to know the word. He says, come to me, come and see. Think about your friends and who you spend a lot of time with. There is a famous quote, quote by a speaker, Jim Ron, that says, we are the average of the five people that we spend the most time with. What he is saying by this is that we are influenced by those around us. The people we spend time with influence our thinking, our actions, and our decisions. When we spend time with our friends, we become more like them. We start using words that they use and saying things that they say and doing things that they do. Who do you spend the most time with? Who is in your top five? Does it make sense to you that if we want to become more like Jesus, that we should spend time with him? The story of Zacchaeus shows us that Jesus wants to know and loves all of us. And the story of Saul shows us the power of God's love and the effect that it has on us when we come to know God and his love for us personally. Let's go back to John chapter 1.
John chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. In the Passion Translation Bible, these verses say, He entered into the very world he created, yet the world was unaware. He came to the very people he created, those that should have recognized him, but they did not receive him. I find it incredible that the Creator himself left heaven and came and dwelt among his sinners in his beautiful, now-tainted creation. The Creator became part of his creation. He isn't a far-off, girl, a far-off God who created our world and then left us to do our own thing and ignore us. He is a God that saw the brokenness in our world and wanted to fix it and came down to earth himself to fix the problem. He is a God that created each of us as individuals and he knows us better than we know ourselves and he wants to be a part of our lives. He wants to walk with us and talk with us. He wants to be side by side with us during our everyday lives. The very people that should have recognised him didn't. Did they stop to give him time? Imagine living in Jesus' day. Would you want to meet him? Would you spend time with him? Would you drop other things to make time to follow him, to ask him questions and get guidance, and to get to know his character and his love? We don't live in Jesus' time, but we still have Jesus, and we can get to know him. He desperately wants to be a part of our lives. He wants us to invite him into our hearts and to get to know him. He has given us his word, the written account of his love, to help us get to know him. I want to encourage all of you to get to know Jesus. Everyone is on different walks, and you may have been walking with him all your life. You may have recently come to know him. You may have walked with him for a time and then fallen away, or you may have never come to know him personally. But this is true for all of us. We all need Jesus. We need a saviour in our lives, and we need the love that only God can provide, a love that we were designed to know. I have seen the change in my life that's happened from spending time each morning reading my Bible and talking to God. I want to ask that all of you would join me in that, to continue or start spending time each morning connecting with God. Get up earlier if you have to, set aside half an hour and make it happen. John 5.39 says, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. We should read the Bible, but we have to remember that the point is not the Bible, it's who the Bible points us to. Saul knew the Bible, but he hadn't come to know who the Bible was pointing him to. The Bible is the written expression of the living expression of God's love. We read the Bible so that we can come to know him more and have a personal relationship with him. We need to spend time in prayer with him, invite him into our lives and days, and give our hearts to him because he desperately wants to know us. Who is in your top five? Jesus invites us to get to know him. The living expression says, come to me, come and see. If you know that you need to start spending time reading the Bible and you want to get to know him and have a personal relationship with Jesus, or you want to continue doing that and encourage others on their walk with him and to encourage people to start getting to know him for themselves, raise your hand with me and let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for being here with us now. Thank you that you're a God that wants to be part of our lives and wants us to know you. You love us so much that you came and died for us and you just want us to realise how much you love us. And I pray that the people here with their hands raised, you'll see them and you'll comfort them and encourage them. I pray that you'll encourage them to start spending time with you or continue spending time with you and encourage others to read your word in the morning and to talk to you daily. It's such an important thing for us to know you. And when we come to realise that love that you have for us, 
then we'll just want to get to know you even more. And I pray that that'll happen for each person here today. So thank you for being with us now. In your precious name, amen. We're going to stand now and sing Great is Thy Faithfulness. I'm sure we're all inspired, and we just want to say thank you uh, to Katie uh, for presenting that to us, um, and also just to send her off uh, as she's heading out to, to continue doing the Lord's work here next week. So our hearts go with her, our prayers go with her, and um, hope you all have a blessed Sabbath. You are dismissed.